Good morning and welcome to worship on this third Sunday after Pentecost and on this Father's Day. It is good to be with you as we worship together. We begin worship this morning with the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear this good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Welcome to Children's Time. I'm out here in our backyard because at this time of the year, I love listening to the birds sing and make all the noises they make. Um, some of them sing like chirpy bird songs, and then there's one that makes this like trilling sound, and they're just really interesting to listen to. In the gospel reading this morning, Jesus talks about how God loves the sparrows. And I don't know if you know what a sparrow is, but you could look it up online. A sparrow is kind of a, uh, just an ordinary bird. There are a lot of sparrows. And there aren't a lot of um, blue jays or bluebirds or cardinals. There aren't any cardinals out here, but sparrows are just pretty ordinary birds. And Jesus said, if God loves even the sparrows, how much more will God love us? I don't know about you, but in these days, I need to remember just how much God loves us. And I hope that that's something that you remember too. It's summertime, and yet it doesn't feel that much different than it felt when we started staying at home. And um, that can be hard to to think about and hard to um, wonder about when we wonder how much longer we'll have to be at home. And certainly I miss being with you in worship. I hear another big bird flying over. It's an airplane. But what I hope you'll remember today is that God loves the sparrows and God loves the blue jays and God loves the hummingbirds and God loves you. Let's do a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for the birds of the air and thank you for loving them. And thank you for loving us. Amen. A reading from Psalm 69. Since it is for your sake that I bear insult, that shame covers my face, I've become an outcast in my own family a stranger to my mother's children. And because I am consumed with zeal for your house, the insults of those who ridicule you fall upon me. When I weep and fast, I receive nothing but abuse. When I dress in sackcloth, I am called a buffoon. They sit at the gate gossiping about me, and the drunks make me the butt of their songs. But I pray to you, Yahweh, for the time of your favor, O God, in your great love, answer me. With you is sure deliverance. Rescue me from the quicksand. Don't let me sink. Let me be rescued from my enemies and from the watery depths. Don't let the raging flood engulf me. Don't let the abyss swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, Yahweh, for your love is wonderful. In your great mercy, turn toward me. Don't hide your face from your faithful one. I am in trouble. Hurry and answer me. Come and ransom my life. As an answer to my enemies, redeem me. A reading from Romans. What can we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace might abound? Of course not. We're dead to sin, so how can we continue to live in it? Don't you know that when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into Christ's death. We have been buried with Jesus through baptism, and we joined with Jesus in death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by God's glory, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with Christ in the likeness of Christ's death, we will also be united with Christ in the likeness of Christ's resurrection. We must realize that our former selves have been crucified with Christ to make the body of sin and failure completely powerless, to free us from slavery to sin. For when people die, they have finished with sin. But we believe that having died with Christ, we will also live with Christ, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will never die again. Death is now powerless over our Savior. When Christ died, Christ died to sin, once for all, so that the life Christ lives now is life in God. 
In this way, you too must consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive in God and Christ Jesus. So don't let sin rule your mortal body and make you obey its lusts. Don't offer the members of your body to sin as weapons of injustice anymore. Rather, offer yourselves to God as people alive from the dead, and your bodies to God as weapons for justice. Sin no longer has power over you, for you are now under grace, not under the law. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. A student is not superior to the teacher. The follower is not above the leader. The student should be glad simply to become like the teacher, the follower like the leader. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of the household? Don't let people intimidate you. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, and nothing is hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in darkness, speak in the light. What you hear in private, proclaim from the housetops. Don't fear those who can deprive the body of life but can't destroy the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Are not the sparrows sold for pennies? Yet not a single sparrow falls to the ground without your Abba God's knowledge. As for you, every hair of your head has been counted. So don't be afraid of anything. You are worth more than an entire flock of sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before Abba God in heaven. Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before Abba God in heaven. Don't suppose that I came to bring peace on earth. I came not to bring peace but a sword. I have come to turn a son against his father, a daughter against her mother, in-law against in-law. One's enemy will be the members of one's own household. Those who love mother or father, daughters or son, more than me are not worthy of me. Those who will not carry with them the instrument of their own death, following in my footsteps, are not worthy of me. You have found your, if you have found your life, you will lose it. And you who lose your life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of our Lord. This section in Matthew is thought to be a piecemeal jumble of sayings from Jesus. Preaching scholars suggest that preachers do not attempt to make sense of the whole gospel, but rather to pick a section to focus on in your sermon. So, I'm going to do what any preacher would do and focus on Romans instead and just leave the gospel behind for now. Romans offers us this discourse on sin and being dead to sin and what that means and how Christ led the way for us to be dead to sin. When we were baptized, our old selves died and we were raised to new life in Christ. We were welcomed into the body of Christ as our sins were washed away and we made this covenant with each other. In our baptismal covenant, we, if we were baptized as adults, or our parents, if we were baptized as children, promise to work for justice and peace. It's right there in our baptismal covenant that we say we will work for justice and peace, right alongside learning the scriptures and the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer and being raised up in the church we will work for justice and peace. We all made that promise. The sin being discussed in Romans isn't just personal sin. It's not just, I did something bad, therefore I have sinned and I need to repent of it. We aren't promising in our baptismal covenants to work for justice and peace for ourselves because we have sinned and will continue to sin. We are promising to work for justice and peace for all people. As Christ said, he has died for all people so they may be raised to new life. The sin that Romans is talking about is corporate sin, systemic sins, homophobia, 
racism, classism, ableism, ageism, any ism or phobia that disconnects us, that infiltrates our system and makes one life more important than another. All sins that are baked into our systems and the fabric of our society that don't allow people to live to the fullest extent of their life. And we can all say that we have been complicit in many of these systemic sins that are just the reality of our society, unfortunately. But as Romans reminds us, there is grace. And I wouldn't be a very good Lutheran preacher if I didn't remind you that there is grace. We have died to sin. God made sure that happened, that we were no longer bound by sin. That is of our old selves. Christ has freed us and made us alive by dying on the cross for all people, by walking this world as God in the flesh, proclaiming good news to all people and battling the systemic sin that is present in our world. So this doesn't mean that that sin won't be present any longer, that we won't be sinners ourselves, but we get to wake up fresh each day and be reminded that we are set free to work for justice and peace, that we are set free from sin, that that will not kill us, that that does not have power over us. And each morning when that fresh water hits your face as you take a shower or as you brush your teeth, I hope that you remember your baptism and tell yourself, I am not bound to sin. I am more than my sins. Christ has set me free. And I hope you'll remember that piece of your baptismal covenant, that you will work for justice and peace. Because we are set free to do so much more than be bound by sin. As Romans urges us, we should use our bodies as weapons of justice to combat the systems of our day that work to oppress and marginalize our bodies as weapons of justice. In church, don't we have work to do, right? When we look around at our world, sin seems pretty binding right now. Our siblings of color are dying in ways that are archaic and racist. Trans people are being murdered and it's being underreported. The wage gap is ever growing as the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The list could go on and on about the ways that we are being divided, the ways isms are infiltrating our system and the ways that we're allowing that to happen. But I truly believe that we are on the precipice of great change in our society. People are using their bodies literally as weapons for justice. Christians around the world are calling out the systemic injustices of our day and taking their baptismal covenant to heart and working for justice and peace throughout the world. And the world is listening, slowly, but listening. Cities are slowly engaging in dialogue about change. The Supreme Court is enacting legislation to protect the most vulnerable among us. We're seeing slow, slow changes. And sometimes that's what it takes to make sure these changes are right. And maybe these are the birth pangs of a new society that we don't even know about yet. And these actions, while I talk about them, seem very political and in the legislative realm and not of the church work, right? But these actions are exactly the work of the church. This is the business of the church to be involved in these actions. These actions of the Supreme Court, of our city governments, are what bring about justice and peace for all of God's beloved children. And we have a role to play in that as Christians who are set free from sin, who use our bodies as weapons of justice, and who have made a promise at baptism to work for justice and peace. 
so children of God, who are no longer bound by sin, who know that death does not have the final word, let us use our bodies as weapons of justice and live into our baptismal covenant, that we will work for justice and peace, having died to sin and being raised to new life in Christ. And let the church say, Amen. Pray together for the church, the world, and all in any need, responding, receive our prayer. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your beloved one. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred that infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. 
Unite us in bonds of love, and through our struggle and confusion, work to accomplish your purposes on earth, so that in your good time, every people and nation may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Christ, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Out of the chaos we cry to you, O God. Enable us to find in Christ the faith to trust your care even in the midst of pain. Assure us that we do not walk alone through the valley of despair, but your love is leading us into life. Christ, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Eternal and loving God, you created us in your own image and likeness, but sin has warped the minds of humanity, and throughout the world there is much injustice and much carelessness of the rights of other people and personal responsibility. Forgive us as we continue to delay the liberation of peoples. We pray, O oh God, that you will right all the wrongs that are taking place in our world and vindicate those that are being treated unjustly. God, in your grace and mercy, we pray that you would give justice and peace to all those that have been cruelly and unfairly treated by their fe fellow siblings and may injustice and carelessness that they have had to endure be the means to draw them into your saving arms of grace. Christ, in your mercy, receive our prayer. O oh God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, Grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination. Where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring ring wings and strengthened dreams. We name before you now all others that are in need of your healing touch. Christ, in your mercy, receive our prayer. O oh God, call us into deeper relationship to be your church for the sake of the world. Help us to see with new eyes the injustices within church and society. Call us to have a loving heart that respects and uplifts the humanity and dignity of every person. Open our ears to listen to and learn from the experiences of people of color. Open our mouths to speak up about injustices. Join us with others to work for racial equity and inclusion for all people. Christ, in your mercy, receive our prayer. We are bold to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now, beloved community, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.